morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Water Matters, a show where we explore issues related to the Great South Bay. My name is Robin Silvestri, and I'm the executive director of Save the Great South Bay. We are a 501c3 nonprofit located here on the south shore of Long Island. And our mission is to protect and preserve the Great South Bay for future generations to enjoy. On today's um, episode, we will be talking about coastal changes and coastal choices with special guest Kevin McAllister of Defend H2O. Defend H2O is a peer organization to save the Great South, to save the Great South Bay with many common, um, common uh, areas of work, including sewage management, shoreline protection, pesticides, uh, dam removal, and so on. Uh, Kevin is the president and co-founder of Defend H2O, and like many of us, he's a lifelong waterman uh, committed to swimming and surfing, rowing and kayaking out in the water. Uh, he is also a committed clean water advocate. Kevin's uh, professional training is deep and diverse, spanning more than three decades working in government, consultancy, and in the nonprofit sectors for environmental protection. His accomplishments include spearheading sewage no discharge zones for vessels operating in the Peconic and the Great South Bay, galvanizing sewage management reforms in Suffolk County, and holding government's feet to the fire on a host of environmental protection issues. Thank you, Kevin, for your efforts. So uh, we are right there with you. Kevin is also the recipient of several awards from environmental agencies for his work in coastal conservation. So with that, I'd like to welcome you, Kevin. Uh, welcome to the show. Work is predominantly my undergraduate work is predominantly in in uh, biological sciences, but my master's uh, degree is in coastal zone management, and much of that is really coastal processes. That was the uh, field of study. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, to, of course, to uh, appropriate management practices on the coast. Uh, for over a decade, I worked uh, for Palm Beach County. Uh, my role was uh, much of the biology around shoreline protection uh, projects. Um, you know, I was instrumental, I think, in, in dune restoration as a project manager for a number of projects uh, in Palm Beach County. Kevin, can uh, I just ask you to pause for a second? I think your sure. video may be off. It, it seems to be. Uh, hold on a minute. You know, I'm not seeing the video for some reason. It's um, having difficulties today, as you know, Robin. Yes. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. Right. Well, we'll carry on then. That's fine. Okay. I apologize about that. It doesn't seem to be uh, showing Cooperating. up. <laughs> Cooperating. So I'll, I'll, I guess, continue to speak if I may. Yes, please. Uh, the, uh, again, the field work in Palm Beach County, I've worked on a host of projects from everything from offshore reefs to try to build beaches, sand bypassing, of course, the, uh, you know, shoreline hardening approaches and sand replenishment, uh, working on a number of projects uh, pertaining to sand replenishment projects. So my breath of, uh, I'll say, beach uh, science uh, runs deep. Uh, my lifestyle is on the beaches. Uh, during my college years, I uh, guarded in South Florida on ocean beaches regularly for years. So, you know, day in and day out, I've seen the changes, uh, which are, I think, important to really, uh, you know, try to define what's going on. Um, I am a, a disciple of Dr. Oren Pilkey, uh, having read his book years ago, The Beaches Are Moving. And it a really good description of uh, beach science and the you know the, what he terms a dynamic equilibrium, and I'd I'd like to walk everyone through the the four factors in this equilibrium. Uh, these are the influences on the coast that ultimately define and shape our beaches, and uh, with respect to also beach management. Uh, there's ocean energy. Certainly, we're experiencing that today. That's uh, wind and waves driving forces. Um, the energy is defined really by the fetch, you know, the wind across the water, you know, the velocity of that wind and, and the duration of which it blows. Um, you know, this will be a quick storm and depending on the, you know, the angle of the winds, how much damage and uh, pile up of water occurs. Uh, the second uh, factor is the shape of the beach. Uh, there's um, consistently what's called an offshore onshore sand cycle. 
So this is uh, summer and winter cycles, essentially. So, you know, those that spend time at the beach, you can certainly see the changes. Uh, summertime, uh, it's a, a higher perch beach. Uh, it's a wider beach. Uh, that's because of the prevailing low energy, just uh, uh, accreting sand building beaches rather than the erosive forces. Uh, and then under, under wave attack like we have today, uh, which then starts kicking in uh, the end of August, September, you know, where you start to see real ocean energy, um, you know, the, the beach will uh, give up material and be dragged offshore to form the sandbars. Uh, and again, that reverses itself in the spring, uh, that sandbar will uh, migrate inshore and ultimately weld onto the beach. So that, you know, that offshore onshore cycle is important. Uh, the shape of the beach, uh, another important factor is, you know, I just described with the offshore onshore cycle, uh, but, you know, this has a, an effect ultimately on the stability of the beaches. Um, littoral drift, uh, important concept, that's the transport of sediments uh, along the coast, longshore, up and down. Um, the net flow for Long Island is from east to west, and that's, uh, again, uh, really defined by today with, uh, you know, these nor'easters with the, the driving energy that will drive from east to west. Uh, but again, in the summer, it can reverse itself, but the net flow is in that direction. And then lastly, uh, sea level rise. Um, you know, I've paid attention to the uh, great outdoors since my childhood, and I, you know, I can show you locations where uh, mature oak trees are long dead because of seawater at their feet in the bays. Um, you know, that is a telltale, of course, of uh, expanding waters and, and expanding bay waters. Uh, my understanding, you know, based on the gauges uh, in the last 20 years, you know, we saw approximately a couple inch rise. And as I'm describing with the, the signs in these bays, uh, New York State has adopted projections uh, that, you know, and this is the uh, medium high range from a 11 to 30 inch rise over the next uh, 30 to 40 years. So, you know, that's exponential. And, you know, I like to say we, we ain't seen nothing yet with respect to the, you know, the influences of those expanding waters. Um, you know, something that we, we haven't talked about and, you know, it's the science is just coming forward, you know, we, compounding uh, sea level rise is the disruption to these ocean gyres. Uh, you know, ocean gyres are currents that uh, circumnavigate uh, the, you know, the big ocean basins. Uh, the Gulf Stream, of course, is our local gyre. Uh, the science is uh, showing that uh, these disruptions pushing cold water down from, you know, Labrador in our area uh, could, you know, have an effect on the Gulf Stream, um, shifting it or disrupting it. Uh, and that is really uh, a, you know, almost the train for the, you know, our climate uh, in the North Atlantic region. So, uh, you know, major influences. Um, coastal changes prompting coastal actions. And, you know, I just described to you kind of the, uh, again, the dynamic equilibrium, how the beach dune system functions and its fluctuations, you know, we live on the edge. So, you know, there's, there's gonna be uh, changes, um, but the actions that are coming forward uh, in particular, I've seen uh, a trend in armoring, coastal armoring, which is the installation of uh, predominantly seawalls and seawalls are of course structures. Uh, they can be steel sheet pile, um, you know, stone revetments, uh, you know, three, four ton boulders uh, stacked, um, geotextile sandbags, which are used uh, in many of the bays. Uh, so these, uh, these structures are coming in at an alarming rate uh, and ultimately affecting and anchoring the shoreline where you're not allowing it to migrate landward. Uh, we end up drowning uh, walkable beaches. So our, our recreational lifestyle here is impacted. And then of course the you know, the fish and wildlife component, uh, you know, shorebirds, uh, lost habitat, horseshoe crabs. Uh, again, this, you know, the elimination of the intertidal zone on these bays, you know, is a critical factor. Um, you know, one area that I've certainly have been paying attention to, we, we talk about trying to restore eelgrass and, you know, there's, a, you know, truly a correlation when you have that die off and, and a rack line of eelgrass up on shorelines, 
you know, if we're encapsulating everything in this bay, uh, the organics, you know, there's, you know, there's uh, secondary and tertiary problems associated with that. Uh, and then lastly, and then I'd love Robert for some questions, but the, you know, the sand replenishment uh, push is certainly ramping up the Fire Island to Montauk Point plan that the Army Corps is now starting to roll out. Um, you know, this is a several billion dollar endeavor over 30 years, but the, you know, the, the basic concept is they're going to dredge offshore and uh, continuously uh, pump segments of beaches from Fire Island Inlet all the way out to Montauk Point in the downtown. Uh, so I've been following that very closely. And again, from my experience uh, with beach replenishment, um, you know, you, you've got to have quality sand, uh, you know, the frequency of storm events, of course, uh, will influence that. Uh, but the, you know, the lifespan of a Nourish beach uh, in the mid-Atlantic region is roughly three to four years. And, you know, then we've got to pump again. And of course, it's extremely costly, you know, tens of millions of dollars a mile to, you know, pump a beach on uh, Fire Island, you know, Shinnecock area, wherever it may be. Um, and I, I believe that over the time, as we're seeing in some of the other uh, southern states where uh, the Army Corps apparently has not been able to um, deliver on its commitment for replenishing these beaches and their, you know, these coastal communities are finding themselves in, you know, dire straits. And I, I think, a, 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 you know, a untalked about component, you know, the reality of it is there's only a, a handful of companies that can perform this scale of, of you know, sand pumping replenishment. Right. And, and when you have, uh, communities up and down the East Coast, you know, all in demand, uh, I, I will never be able to keep pace with the demand over time as I described the sea level rise. So yeah. That's so kind of, of a, in a yeah. way, uh, I've tried to uh, frame, frame the it. issue a bit yeah, uh, for us, Robin, so, you know, we can then take off on some questions and explore these issues. Yeah, so I have a couple of questions that come to mind as you're speaking. So maybe you can go back and for the audience, talk about um, the coastal armoring and, and who is doing this armoring and what's the purpose of it? I mean, you clearly have outlined the effects of it, but, you know, why, why is it happening to begin with? Well, the uh, four influences that I described, so sea level rise and the erosive forces of energy, um, you know, the response uh, both from government as well as private property owners, uh, holy cow, I'm losing, you know, my, my waterfront, my backyard mm -hmm. on a bay or, you know, oceanfront, uh, my pools are about to topple in, you know, I, I need protection. So, you know, they seek to install the structures. Again, these could be steel sheet pile wall, sea walls, right. um, you know, uh, big lengthy uh, stone revetments, uh, geotextiles. These are all designed to protect what's behind them. But the, the collateral damage, unfortunately, is uh, the fronting beach uh, is, you know, erosion is accelerated and disappears. And then you have the secondary impacts to recreation and fish and wildlife habitat. Well, how about so the impact just simply on the neighbors? I mean, one person puts up a wall, the, the water is still coming in, so it has to go somewhere. Oh, great point, Robin. Um, you know, these individual projects, let's take a, a property that maybe 200 feet, 300 feet and um, you know, the homeowner's installed structure, uh, you know, there's uh, basically physics, uh, it's called end scour, you know, at the ends of these structures, you know, you get almost an eddy effect during storm events and, and energy, uh, then you in, uh, cause more scour. So you compel your neighbor to follow suit, you know, because now all of a sudden because of uh, property A, property B is eroding, uh, oh, I need a wall, and then you just push it down the line. And you know, when we're talking in terms of 10, 20 years, 30 years time frames, you know, the the uh, infiltration of these structures, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, you connect a dot where you know just lengthy reaches of shoreline is now armored, you know, in this assortment of structure, just causing problems. Right. And you know, we have to, I guess, ask ourselves, you know, are we willing as a community, a larger uh, in the generic sense to, you know, allow this trend to continue at the loss of, again, public resources. 
Right. I, I can imagine, you know, here on the South Shore, um, maybe a little different than the North Shore where they have those more, uh, the cliffs. But here on the South Shore, I would imagine that coastal hardening comes in the form of bulkheading along the, uh, along the coast. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, Montauk in particular, obviously the lighthouse, a very sizable stone revetment that's uh, being refurbished as we speak with uh, bigger stone and, you know, bigger, broader and stronger. Uh, you know, there's uh, uh, geotextile sandbags in downtown Montauk over, a, you mm -hmm. know, a half a mile, um, you know, that is, you know, causing problems and will cause problems, certainly in the future. And then as, you know, points uh, west, uh, there's geotextiles in, in uh, Fire Island, um, you know, there might even be stone out there, I'm, I'm not certain of that. But, you know, these structures are definitely coming in. And you know, I would argue that our regulatory agencies at the state level and down to the local level have, have been, you know, uh, primarily permissive, uh, you know, against their own regulations that uh, really the, you know, the goal is to protect these natural resources, yeah. beaches, dunes, bluffs, you know, these are important natural features that are supposed to be intact. And, and again, by virtue of the structures, we are uh, impairing those natural resources. I think we see that here also on the South Shore, Kevin, and I'm sorry, I keep bringing it back to the South Shore, but that's our, you know, that's our of area um, is with the wetlands and, you know, the decimation of the wetlands that serve as the second line of defense, as they've been recently called by one of the top county execs, um, the second line of defense after the barrier beaches, you know, you have Fire Island, which is a, a it's a living structure. Uh, so it seems almost um, crazy to think that that Fire Island will stay the way it does every year. It, it changes every year. Uh, I believe it has lengthened itself past the Fire Island Lighthouse, which I believe was at one point was the end of Fire Island, nearly five miles to the to the west. Well, that certainly speaks to littoral drift, Robin. And again, the net flow from east to west. So over the you know decades or centuries here, the you know, the, the movement of sand is obviously pronounced. Um, you know, you, you spoke about wetlands and, you know, a, a real concern is that we will pinch these wetlands. So the structures that I'm describing, these bulkheads and seawalls of stone and, and steel, you know, they're coming in to protect private property and, and the uplands and structures. Uh, what's in front of them often is uh, fringe wetlands or even expansive tidal marshes. And you know, as sea level rises, uh, the ability for these uh, wetlands to migrate and continue to move landward to find that right elevation, uh, these structures pinch it off. So over the long term, again, we're talking decades, um, we will drown these wetlands where, again, they, they just can't keep pace. Right. Uh, and then we're pinching them off. So we're, you know, we'll, we'll lose wetlands if, if we're not careful with these structures. And how about the, how about regulatory wise? Like what what um, what programs or um, policies do you know of that are there to protect these these living shorelines? Robin, it's Promote well them. founded, um, and the you know the regulatory structure uh, for New York uh, dates back to the believe the uh, early '80s, and you know ultimately through federal law, the you know uh, Coastal Management Act, uh, it compelled the states to adopt. Um, regulations that would protect, again, the integrity of the coast. Natural resources is the priority. Uh, ultimately, New York State, uh, that was developed through the Department of State and then the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, they are charged through the uh, environmental conservation law and the regulations to administer the permitting or the mm -hmm. regulatory oversight. And what's key here, while these natural protective features, uh, beaches, dunes, bluffs, flats, you know, these are all, again, the, the, the fringe, the edge, uh, and how important they are to, uh, you know, the estuarine ecology, as well as our, again, public use, um, you know, but the, the uh, administrators and the permitting, you know, we're protecting private property while sacrificing these uh, natural protective features. So, uh, things are a bit fast backwards, um, you know, we're not getting it done. And, you know, if we don't change course soon here and really commit to protecting what's left, 
um, you know, again, this trend will, you know, it, it will swallow itself and, you know, we'll, we'll end up just uh, encapsulating bays with walls and ocean beaches as well, if, if we're not careful. Right. So, you know, Kevin, we're very pragmatic here at Save the Great South Bay. We, we know that development is going to happen and there's no stopping it. But we really we um, rather than saying, you know, put things back the way they, they used to be, because that's that's really not practical. Um, it's really how do we move forwards in uh, in a sustainable way? You know, how do we um, do we retreat back from the shorelines? Do we build in different ways? What are ways that you know citizens can push back and ask about projects in, you know to harden shorelines or to prevent them? Good, good point, Robin. It, you know, and and you know, please, I guess for the audience and others, you know, I, I try to uh, speak about a thirty foot thousand foot view. You know, so this isn't trying to single out homeowners that, um, you know, put in seawalls, they're concerned about their property. It's, you know, it's just individual trends, but, you know, we need to start reversing things, particularly where waterfront properties, we've, we've got to accept and adopt uh, the notion of a, a natural transitional areas. So, you know, instead of these lawns, uh, let's start converting to either wetlands or Mm -hmm. um, you know, other buffer zones, forested areas, but to kind of put back the natural fringe that's going to buffer the sea as well as uh, buffer our own right. upland source pollutants that are running into these water bodies. So mm -hmm. it's incumbent that we, we do th diff things differently in our backyards. Yeah, we, we, we look at it from the, from the two sides as well. You know, what's going into the water, but what's coming back out of the water onto land. Um, I'm just going to read out a couple of questions that have come in from the audience and maybe oh, like wonderful. To address them. Uh, so from Nick DeMarco, my understanding is that the wetland marshes are fed by sand blowing from the barrier beaches. If the barrier beaches are hardened by construction, then the wetlands would appear to be sinking. Is there a plan to nourish the wetlands? Um, within the Fire Island to Montauk Point plan, um, the, the Army Corps has devised uh, what they're terming coastal processes features. And, you know, the intent is to try to mimic some of the overwash and, but ultimately I'm concerned because of the dredging within the, the bay side, and it could even be ocean, uh, the sea floor, but ultimately to fill the backside of the barrier island in these narrow locations to try to, um, you know, bolster elevation and thus protection. But, you know, we've got to be very careful that we're not adversely impacting wetlands, um, you know, in, in, in the course of doing this. Um, you know, it's, we're, we're managing these barrier islands as static, um, you know, uh, right. terrain. And that, that's just not the case. They need to roll over and move. And uh, the, the more we impose hard lines on, on these, you know, coastlines, you know, it, it truly is problematic in the long term. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so here's a question from uh, Ed Reagan, and I think there were a, a couple of uh, people who were interested in your viewpoints on the, the Bellport Breach, the new inlet um, that's, that's closing. How will pumping of sand along Fire Island affect that new inlet? Will there be unintended consequences? And related to that um, was um, a question about, will the Army Corps ultimately close the breach due to Superstorm Sandy? Uh, Superstorm that. Sandy, that's uh, which uh, peeled open the breach. Right. Uh, I, with others, uh, I, at the time I was serving as Peconic Baykeeper and uh, very supportive of leaving it open and not a rash decision to mobilize the Army Corps to close, uh, you know, enormous money as well as, uh, you know, the secondary impacts. I, I believe it's uh, certainly shown its, its uh, value in, in improving water quality with having a flush in, you know, in the uh, back end of Great South Bay where you get into the narrows. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased, you know, the community at large and the elected officials uh, after some pause realize that there may be benefits. Uh, I always speak about natural processes. So if it, you know, closes, it closes and I've been following it uh, and great photo uh, photography by some of the local photographers that are involved with your group. It, it's spectacular to really see that firsthand. But you know, um, with respect to the nourishment and the pumping of sand on these uh, various segments of Fire Island, I mean, you are obviously 
uh, providing a, a sand source, you get littoral drift, uh, you know, depending on the, where that material is placed, you know, it is a, a, a I'll say a pulse of sand that could obviously, um, you know, close a, a breach and natural in that inlets that's been open. But, um, you know, the good news is we, we benefited from it for some years and uh, we didn't intervene in a, an important natural process to, you know, artificially close it. So right. uh, nature took its course. Looks like nature's taking uh, its course continuously over there and looking like it might close at, at some point in the near future. Yeah, I saw that last uh, uh, photograph, I believe. And yeah, it looks like on the edge, but uh, one doesn't know what this storm will do. Um, right, even this know, storm today could have had an impact on it, right? It could close it or open it or have no effect, but you know, time will tell. I think it's one of the, um, you know, in working with Save the Great South Bay, I've, I've really learned a lot of things about the local environment and uh, the, um, the processes. And it, the more I, I see, the more I think, you know, Mother Nature has its way of doing things. And the more we try to fight that um, the, with man-made or engineered solutions, it seems that it's a, a losing battle for us um, to try and fight the, you know, the will of mother nature. We see that over at Gilgo Beach, every time there's a big storm and I wouldn't be surprised if even today's storm um, had that impact of the, 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 the smile opens up at Gilgo Beach where there once was an inlet. And, uh, and every, every year, the, the, um, I'm not sure if it's the Army Corps of Engineers or the town or the state or who actually is responsible for it, but they pump the sand back, back onto Gilgo Beach. Robin, you know, as I, speak about and you were alluding to it earlier you know i i do believe that again over the long term um sand replenishment is both economically and environmentally unsustainable mm -hmm. uh, but with that said obviously as uh with respect to sand management you know we've we've got to do things better particularly at these navigable inlets that we have created um you know dredging deep cuts that create these jets that uh jet uh uh, beach sand offshore into deposits, as well as, you know, on a flood tide, bringing it in into a, a, what's called a flood delta. So this is, uh, you know, uh, sand within the system that is, is essentially lost unless we intervene. And, you know, I have felt that uh, locally, and I'm speaking the greater Long Island, you know, we've done a very poor job of uh, managing sand at the navigable inlets with what's called inlet bypassing where the material that is either lost or retained on the updrift side, you know, is moved across to try to replenish, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a, a dwindling sand supply, a sand star beach on the downdrift side. Uh, within the FIMP plan, the Army Corps, as I understand it, they're going to dredge the uh, navigable channels every two years. And then uh, on uh, the, you know, two year cycles, on the, on the four year cycle would be the offshore sandbars and mm -hmm. um, you know, that flood del uh, ebb shoal that I'm describing. And I, I think we, the frequency of bypassing has to be stepped up. And I, I think we, we've gotta be more aggressive in recovering lost sand just to ultimately uh, you know, try to uh, maintain some kind of pace and semblance of you know, wider beaches that would otherwise uh, be highly vulnerable with uh, you know, the depletion that occurs at these inlets. Yeah, I, I have um, a couple of questions in from the audience, if you don't mind. Um, so Bob Weymouth asked, um, shoreline hardening is, uh, shoreline hardening destroys intertidal habitat and wetlands, and there is no line in the sand where the Army Corps and DEC won't permit hardening. This is happening faster and faster. Do you see this changing? Um, let me, let me speak to the core, um, you know, from, from my experience and in being involved in projects and, you know, obviously um, advocating and being uh, certainly abreast of their uh, plans, you know, they are all about engineering. So more sand and structure to protect, you know, what's behind it. The, the, the environmental sensitivities, um, you know, quite frankly, has been wanting. Um, so unless there's a real, I, a movement by the people, you know, I call it an awakening. I mean, we've got to realize that, you know, in order to protect natural resources, we've got to make hard choices. And that requires moving back in some locations rather than, 
uh, investing, you know, millions of dollars in uh, staff gap measures. Uh, the sooner we recognize that, the better off we'll be. So, you know, an area that I have found uh, the public at large um, just is not aware of the details of these plans, such as the FIM plan. And if they are in fact informed, um, you know, here's a, a key question, you know, the Army Corps uh, through federal dollars of uh, the first iteration, I call it. So as they come from West to East, you know, Robert Moses uh, into Montauk, they will pump sand um, at, on the federal dime. So the 100% federal uh, right. costs are covered. The second, third, fourth iterations uh, down the road of uh, four or five years every uh, on that frequency, it becomes, I believe, a 65, 35 cost share. That 35 uh, from the state of New York, up the county and the locals. Um, you know, I keep asking the question, how is this being paid for? Exactly. And the, the answers aren't coming. So there's, you know, we've got to really start asking hard questions. Uh, I think there's need to be an acknowledgement that, you know, it's a futile process over long term and then start instituting, um, you know, moving back strategies in the, you know, in the more highly vulnerable areas rather than just continue to invest development and um, government monies into trying to, you know, prop these locations up. Yes, and I, could you define for us, um, I do this word of the week for Save the Great South Bend, and I'm thinking this might be one of them, but um, coastal retreat, what does that actually look like? I know there's big talk about it out in the, um, in the Mastic Beach area of houses that were destroyed by Sandy or haven't been re-inhabited to, to really to not allow them to be built back, but is, you know, is this what coastal retreat means to you? Rob, and I use that term freely because, you know, in, in back in my training, that's the vernacular that, you know, I became aware of through, through teachings and coastal retreat is meaning, you know, you're moving back, uh, responding to a, a changing shoreline, a migrating shoreline. And, you know, of course, it's not easy in uh, urbanized areas and not practical back to the practicality of, you right. know, let's say the Long Beach area, you know, I mean, there's just too much development. You've, you know, you've got to engineer your way. Um, but, you know, when we get into lower development areas, Fire Island, for instance, the front row, um, you know, rather than just continuing to try to, you know, uh, add sand and seawalls, um, you know, nature's taking its course and, and clipping off the front row, uh, just let Fire Island roll and, you know, uh, out toward Dune Road and Shinnecock. Um, again, we've got to be accepting the fact that we, we just, um, you know, we can't maintain our, our physical location given the dynamics that, you know, with climate change that we're experiencing. And it's, uh, again, the sooner we recognize this because, um, you know, the, the investments are only gonna uh, be exponential uh, the longer we delay. And I'll, I'll give you a perfect example in this, you know, is out in the region, but, you know, there's recognition in downtown Montauk uh, some five, six, seven years ago, you know, that we're, the front row would inevitably have to be extinguished. Um, but, you know, the, the actual planning steps to get there uh, has been slow in coming. And, mm -hmm. you know, 10, 15 years can go by very quickly, um, you know, in, in our cycles, if you will. And, you know, this inaction just makes it even more difficult, particularly when we're going the other way by adding more homes and Mm -hmm. uh, restoring pools that have been lost to mother nature. I mean, that's, that's going backwards rather than being adaptive. So and is, is the, is the roadblock here at the municipal level? Is it at the county level? Uh, you know, where, where can we be advocating or what, what, what are ways that citizens can push back? Well, the, again, the regulations come down from almost the state level down uh, to a local level with administration, but you know, at the end of the day, it's um, policy decisions. So this is really our elected officials. And, you know, I, I think, um, you know, whether it be a town level or Suffolk County, we, we've got to continue to talk about this and examine the hard questions, you know, the critical thinking that I, I speak of, you know, with, with this approach, is it sustainable? And again, if, uh, you know, the recognition should be, no, it's not. So, you know, let's try to urge our elected officials to really show courage 
that, um, you know, to make uh, very difficult decisions today, which impact people's lives, um, obviously monetary impacts, mm -hmm. but the, you know, the real dividends uh, will be paid, you know, decades later when, um, you know, by virtue of a new policy or, or affecting, you know, the regulations, uh, 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 defending the regulations that, you know, we have uh, walkable shorelines for future generations. Right, right, right. Thank you, Kevin. So there's a, a couple of other questions that have come in. Um, so Bob, uh, thanks for joining us today, Bob. I just want to acknowledge your uh, comment that the inlet, the Bellport Inlet is in the federal wilderness area. So the Army Corps of Engineers cannot close it. That is correct. They cannot close it and they cannot keep it open artificially. That, that inlet is what it is. And that is a prime, and for me, a pure beautiful example of mother nature taking, uh, taking her course. Um, Nick DeMarco, you mentioned that the new inlet stagnated Patchogue Bay, um, as explained at a previous meeting, so mixed results. I don't know so much that it's stagnated Patchogue Bay. I would say most of the Great South Bay, if not all of it, is stagnated. Um, the stagnation may have become more, more apparent in comparison to the, um, the clarity that we got at Bellport Bay due to the, to the inlet opening up. Uh, you know, we already are starting to see a reverse in that trend in Bellport Bay as the inlet starts to close. Uh, Nick also mentioned, where are we on stopping rainwater from streets draining directly into the bay? Um, <laughs> Kevin, do you have an answer to that? Because where else is the rainwater going to go? It's, it's going to go, it goes down our storm drains and, and it goes right into the bay. Our, um, our efforts from Save the Great South Bay are really to keep that storm water as clean and clear as possible because the quality of the water in the bay is, is dependent upon the quality of the water entering it. So this is where Nick, where we come in and we ask for um, people to reduce their use of pesticides and to, um, you know, to be mindful of uh, oil spills and things that are um, staying on the water, and also to implement some green infrastructure in the upland. So on Long Island, um, things as bioswales, rain gardens, uh, rain barrels, ways to keep the water uh, directly on your properties um, and uh, that will allow the water to re-infiltrate into the ground. Uh, and then you had a next question, Nick, was this one might be more towards you, Kevin. When are the communities on the barrier beaches going to stop using cesspools, which are directly leaching into the bay? I don't know if you have any insight on this, Kevin. I have a little information from over in Ocean Beach. Well, you actually peaked an important point. Um, you know, as, as much as we're talking about the physical, you know, where the shoreline is and what's stable, you know, beach-wise, uh, as sea level rise is coming up, you know, there's, um, subterranean, I'll, I'll describe it simplistically as a kind of a sea wedge, a salt wedge that comes in from ocean subterranean. So there's co-mingling waters in the groundwater, uh, you know, immediate, on the immediate coast and depending on proximity. But, you know, ultimately, um, you know, our septic systems uh, on the, you know, the waterfront areas, um, you know, they are immersed in groundwater. So that's, that's a real problem um, you know, you're not getting the natural biological treatment through dry soils. So the, the saturation of our cesspools and septic, um, you know, is problematic. Uh, I know certainly the Suffolk County has uh, ambitious and warranted plans to try to address this through sewering uh, and then uh, implementation of uh, advanced treatment, these IA systems where sewing is not, sewering is not possible. Right. But again, we can't lose sight of sea level rise and that infiltration. And, you know, what we, uh, you know, I, I, it was coined down in Miami, sunny day flooding and the new moon and full moons because of the uh, increased tidal cycles uh, and that perched groundwater that I'm describing. Right. Um, you know, you can have dry days that are with a high tide, all of a sudden that neighborhood's flooded, Mastic right. Beach, right. case in point. And over the long term, with coastal inundation, that rising of water below, you know, unless we're going high uh, with homes and then roads and infrastructure, you know, it just compels the point that you know we've got to exit some of these areas that are just, um, you know, just untenable over the long term. Yeah, I'm I'm here and I'm based in Babylon, and we see that. I like that term. Was it sunny day flooding? 
uh, I don't like the term, but um, the term is spot on because we get here, you know, if you get a high tide and a full moon and you're getting flooding uh, down on our coastal, you know, Lindenhurst, um, West Babylon, Babylon, all those coastal areas. Robin, you, you described it perfectly being, you know, resonant in a, a zone that experiences it. And, uh, you know, that's getting more pronounced. I mean, I, you know, my neck of the woods, Dune Road and Shinnecock area, uh, having traveled that for years and years and, you know, again, drawing on decades ago, visually, you know, periodically that road would flood, but, you know, with storm events now, I mean, really, it's just a, a, a new moon on a, you know, a higher tide and, you know, it's under six inches right. of water. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, Mrs. Birds asked, will the future installation of wind turbines offshore affect the beaches? And as it will or how? <laughs> because, you know, when you when you change something, it, the, there's always that ripple effect. There's always those maybe unintended consequences. So what do you think of uh, the, as the impact of the wind turbines on our beaches? Rob and I weighed in on this uh, for the South Fork Wind Project, you know, off of Montauk. Right. And now right. subsequently, there's, you know, obviously the second um, project's forthcoming, at the Sunrise Wind, it's called. Um, but, you know, where I had weighed in, there was um, misplaced concern that the cable, as it uh, comes from the turbines, comes ashore, um, you know, they employ what's called directional drilling. And, uh, you know, they can achieve uh, pretty deep depths. Um, you know, their target depth, I believe, is uh, 30, 35 feet deep of the cable from the, the land to the coupling, which is offshore, you know, roughly... Uh, you know, a half a mile or so, um, you know, I, I see no impact to the beach. It's at a deep enough depth that, you know, any changes to uh, the beach and elevation and location, you know, I, I think it would be, uh, it would bypass that active zone just based on, you know, it's, it's uh, depth and breadth of, uh, you know, the, the landing cable itself. So uh, no impact in my opinion. Uh, interesting, interesting. Um, and Minnie, from out from your area, hi Minnie, I'm glad you could join us. Can you give us some examples of the best ways to get our elected officials to change their priorities? And how about the DEC? Elected officials, it, it means, um, you know, voicing, registering um, either concerns, uh, opposition or support for that matter. But you know, trying to prioritize, again, natural shorelines and, um, you know, for, for uh, again, future generations. So it's, it's a bit of an activism role, uh, certainly in, in my capacity in the organization, uh, like uh, Save Great South Bay, we're, we're advocates, we give voice to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to keep resonating these themes. So if I leave you today, there's a host of questions and, and um, sensitivities to, you know, pursuing sand replenishment and coastal armoring. So, you know, let's, let's uh, change course on this ship and you got, we got to turn the wheel together. So that means really showing up in different forms, uh, letters to the editor, communications to your elected officials, and then where the opportunities arise, you know, uh, you know, more uh, demonstrative, forceful, um, you know, appearances and numbers to, you know, try to uh, move our elected officials to, you know, put aside uh, election cycles and start to think about uh, long-term sustainability. Right, right. I do believe, um, I'm a big believer in many voices uh, carry power versus the single voices. And so that's where I think organizations like Defend H2O and Save the Great South Bay can come and, and speak on behalf of, uh, but with the support, you know, we can't be out there uh, on our own either. We need we need the support of our uh, followers to um, to say hey, this is you know this is a stance that we want to take. This is a, an issue that we want to explore. You can't fight every you know you can't fight on every front. You have to pick a few specific issues. So if you had to pick, Kevin, um, what would be? I think you said the sand replenishment and um, and the coastal armoring would be your two top priorities to um, to follow up on. We, we need to prevent the armoring because there's uh, really a, a point of no return, you know, when we armor the coast. Um, you know, the sand replenishment, you know, although I, I refer to it as Folly Beach, 
you know, tens of millions of dollars a mile only to see it disappear in a storm event or, you know, even in best case, four or five years later. Um, you know, in a way, I, I won't say there's no harm, but um, we can reverse course if we get it. Uh, but you're going down the path of wholesale armoring of, of ocean beaches and bay waters, um, you know, obliterating uh, walkable beaches and, and, you know, drowning wetlands, you know, we, we've got to really uh, hold the line and defend against that. And, you know, I think this forum, um, Robin, has been great. And I know you, you guys do this often and just bringing education. So, you know, if, if I offered some uh, food for thought today, that's wonderful where, you know, maybe the listeners then become more active with the group and, you know, we, we'll, we'll figure out and define the ways to bring that voice uh, collectively forward. We are big advocates of conversation, uh, conversation on all levels. Um, one on the education side for our followers. You know, I, I, I'm not a scientist. Um, I didn't come to save the Great South Bay even as an environmentalist. I came as a volunteer, and but what I've learned has kept me here. And I've learned um, basically a new vocabulary, Kevin, uh, a new vocabulary of uh, environmental words. And so, on the education side, we try to break those words down for people to say, you know, what is what is coastal erosion? What does it mean? You know, you hear the terms thrown about, but it's um, sometimes they can seem so abstract. And so, on our education side, we really try to take those abstract issues and, and break them down for the everyday person to understand not only what the issue is, but, um, but what concrete steps they can take as an individual. Our, our motto is start where you stand, you know, and we can't all fix the polar ice caps, but, you know, we can start in our backyards and say, hey, I, I see this coastal armoring going on right in my neighborhood. You know, this is a chance for me to have a voice. And I think I think that's what you brought for us today, Kevin. You really broke down the issues for us, and uh, and made them more accessible. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, Rob. And I, I feel good about things. I think you know, relative to public awareness, that we're at a place where, you know, these issues are percolating now. And uh, you know, let's let's you know really get in line together and you know lock arms and really start to ask the hard questions and and. Uh, um, compel our elected officials to again prioritize, uh, you know, public natural resources, and yeah. you know the the actions today will protect, you know, uh, decades out, uh, you know what what exists. It's really the the only way forward. We're otherwise destroying. It. We live on an island, you know. There's we're destroying it. And it, it's uh, this is not easy for elected officials and yeah. you know the public at large, and you know. These are not easy choices, and that's why I think we've been avoiding them. You know, rather than tackling them head on, we've you know been per permissive with the structures. You know, right, the right. homeowners, I, and, and I think, you know, uh, we've got to reverse that. So yeah, your um the the title of this was coastal coastal changes, coastal choices, and sometimes making the right choice is not an easy one, as we can see. Exactly. So I just have one last question for you from a, a dear friend of our organization, Ed Reagan. Uh, what is your view on opening of the Gilgo Inlet over at um, uh, off, uh, off Ocean Parkway? Um, the Stony Brook professor said that Jones Beach interacts with Fire Island Inlet causing unintended consequences. So to, to, um, to say it's not opening a new inlet at Gilgo, um, I'm not sure how familiar with the issue you are or not, Kevin. Um, there was an inlet there at one point, and uh, it was closed by Robert Moses in the building of Ocean Parkway. And so our organization is advocating for that, that inlet to be restored, not for a new inlet to be created, but for the inlet that Mother Nature tries to take back every year, uh, for that to be finally just um, engineered in a way that, that uh, Mother Nature can breach back to the, um, back to the bay. You have any thoughts on that? Well, I do know the history, certainly of uh, the South Shore and Fire Island, with the myriad of inlets that punch through on these bays. Um, you know, I am aware that it existed. I I would just say, um, you know, the the goals and objectives are are good. You know, water quality uh, certainly is probably um, you know the priority one, uh, but we've got to be very careful with the unintended consequences, you know, with sand transport as I'm describing. And, right. um, you know, so there's, it, it really has to be examined closely and, and um, you know, caution to the wind on, on evasive uh, actions such as that. That's all. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and finally, Mrs. Bird asked, um, is there a list of individuals at the local level that they can um, uh, contact? She's on the board of the League of Women Voters of Brookhaven and a list would be helpful to them. But Kevin, perhaps it's something that you and I can work on together as our two organizations and come up with a, uh, a, a general a letter on, on behalf of the issue for people to um, adapt and make their own. What do you think of that? Yeah, no, that would be great. And, uh... You know, just let's uh, really start to ask the hard questions and and we can help frame that, uh, Robin, with your help and then, uh, you know, distribute that to interested uh, parties. And, you yeah. know, we all just start to weigh in and, you know, just compel to really to, to account for these actions. Let's not kick the can down the road. And yeah. that's, uh, in my opinion, what we've been doing where, you know, it's too hard. The choices are too hard. Let's delay. And, you know, we don't have time to delay. We, we are either going to be in all in today or, you know, just surrender to, you know, loss of uh, public resources. Yes. Yeah. Uh, related to Gilgo Beach, you have one beach west of there is Cedar Beach. And there is some uh, a Cedar Beach and Overlook Beach. They are experiencing tremendous, um, tremendous beach beachfront losses. Any any thoughts on those? Is it related to the Fire Island dredging? Uh, I'm sure it is. Again, with these navigable navigable inlets because you you need to dredge them to depths that are safe for navigation mm -hmm. but they they create uh what's called you know almost like a venturi effect in other words they you know will accelerate current so on a, a flood tide you know coming into that neck into the inlet is accelerated the ability to carry a great deal of sediment inside then drop it uh, the same is true on an ebb tide. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, back to sand bypassing in a very meaningful strategic way, going after that flood delta regularly and just keeping that, you know, uh, feed the beast in a way. Um, you know, we got to keep the sand out there on the inlets that would, uh, you know, that is being lost and retained uh, just to, you know, keep uh, some semblance of keeping pace. But again, back to reality, um, can we, Key pace with uh, the sea mm -hmm. level rise and the changes of, of our barrier islands. And, um, you know, I, I think it's, we're going to find out it's a losing prospect and, and thus we've got to start thinking about different strategies. Strategies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Megan Barron said uh, the trustees in my town, South Hold, out in your neck of the woods, are responsible for issues within 100 feet of the shorelines and are therefore hugely important. So keeping abreast of their permit calendar can be very helpful. Thank you, Megan. That's a great tip. That's a great tip. So Kevin, I think I would like to wrap it up, but I, I do feel like um, we could walk away with a really great next step of uh, an open letter to our public officials um, on the issues of uh, coastal hardening and, and, their, uh, and beach replenishments. I think that would be a great place for us to start and continue our great collaboration. Wonderful, I, I agree. And I apologize to you, Robin, and, and the uh, viewers <laughs> for being uh, name only. I'm sorry. I uh, don't understand why the video is not showing. But you know. you know, those things happen, Kevin. But have, yeah. if you're not, we will have you back for a, um, a full on visual I, presentation. Where I have a radio voice, I hope. <laughs> you have a great voice. You have a great voice. <laughs> okay. It was a pleasure having you today. Thank you, and, Robin. And really we'll talk pleasure. again soon. For everybody okay. who's out in the audience, this, uh, this session has been recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel. Uh, a link to the YouTube video will be sent out to everybody who has registered as well as put on up on uh, Save the Great South Bay social media. Thank you again, uh, Kevin McAllister of Defend H2O for joining us on this um, episode of Water Matters. And we'll see you again in a few weeks. Thank you, Robin. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.